I just want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, tonight's gallery talk is part of our series offering unique perspectives on the art, artists, and era of the Soul of the Nation exhibition, which we're standing in right now. From gallerists and cultural leaders who are working during the time frame of the exhibition, and community activists organizing today in South Los Angeles, to emerging artists who have been influenced by the artists in Soul of the Nation. Tonight, I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Damien Sojourner and Hassani Simons. <laughs> Damien M. Sojourner is a, an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Irvine. He researches the relationship among the public education system, prisons, and the construction of black masculinity in Southern California. In addition to his work appearing in many popular media forms, he has written articles in scholarly journals such as Transforming Anthropology, Race, Education, and Ethnicity, Cultural Anthropology, and the Berkeley Review of Education. His book, First Strike, Prison and Educational Enclosures in Black Los Angeles, was re released by the University of Minnesota Press. How's the volume? Is, it, is that good? Is it, Hassani Simons is a community organizer, artist, and student. Growing up in South Central Los Angeles has informed both his intimate understanding of the suffering black people experience from the police and prison system, as well as an analysis of how alternative systems that are offered as solutions to him and his peers, namely education, housing, welfare, and other social services, just sustain state violence. Today, led by his passion for music and art, Hassani creates art reflective of his experiences to improve life outcomes for young people. So without further ado, I will turn the mics over to Damien and Hassani. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. Appreciate that. Um, Hassani and I uh, first met at the Southern California Library, which is located off of uh, Vermont. Uh, right near Vermont and Gage in South Central LA. And uh, we purposely chose this area of the exhibit um, because many of the items here actually were lent from the Southern California uh, Library. <clears throat> and the director of the Southern California Library, Yusuf Omawali, uh, is standing right there. Hi, Yusuf. <laughs> and much of what our discussion is going to be about in part has been informed by political education courses, classes, workshops, just general conversations that emanated from the Southern California Library uh, itself. So I want to really recognize that space within uh, this space. So the way that we're going to do this, essentially I'm going to interview Hassani. I'm going to ask him questions because this man is uh, a genius, uh, to, to put it mildly. Um, and then towards the end, hopefully we'll have time uh, for Q&A. So, Hassani, one of the key tenets from the Black Power movement was this idea that the organizations that were key for development of liberation are already present within communities. There's no need to sort of come in and transform that. And I can't think of any other example more fitting than that than of the Black Panther Party chapter here in LA. Uh, and many of, you see many of the pieces uh, by Douglas that were part of the BPP, in particular with Bunchy Carter being one of the main folks who was um, leading sort of this charge. And Bunchy knew immediately, instinctively, to go to the Slossons, right? To take from the Slossons and incorporate the Slossons into that chapter and really build up the Black Panther Party chapter. And from our conversations, I know you have been very keen on this notion that those structures still are in place. And in particular with organizations such as the Brims, to use that structure that's already there to help develop models for liberation in the current times. Could you explain more about that? Yeah, exactly. So uh, pretty much when you look at how Bunchy Carter went about organizing and how he went, he used his uh, resources that he had with the Slossons. The Slossons are a, a gang is such a heavy term, but you know, for, for lack of a better term, the Slossons are, are a, a black gang that originated in the early 90s, in the early 60s, early, early 60s or 50s. So uh, 
the fact that he was able to go and uh, channel his his uh, relationship with these guys, with these these gang members or whatnot, you know, and to, to have these guys that have of influence in their neighborhood, these guys that are uh, charismatic, these guys that have the potential to lead others into into doing something that's prosperous and that's helpful for the black community. The people that he reached out to weren't weren't, weren't scholars, you know, are not the type of scholars that we're used to hearing about. They didn't go to Ivy League colleges. They were guys that looked like me, not dressed like this, you know, maybe a little more baggy clothes, but people, people that look like what the media portrays as thugs, were organizing communities. These guys were making sure there was breakfast, in, there were breakfasts in houses and in schools and making sure young black kids were getting educated, you know, making sure parents were being able to be at home. And these are, these are, these are efforts that are coming from the black community within people that have gang ties, you know? So it's not, it's not about these people are vicious or these people are that, these people are this, you know, how the media portrays black people, us to be. It's the fact that it is, power to organize and it is power in the black community to come together and to be unified but these leaders are being taken away so we are they, they're being identified by the police and they're being stripped away from the community how do we keep that from happening but it, it, it is a great it is a great thing that uh, that he was able to to reach out and, to, and was able to develop a, a branch that led to be the, what is known as the black panther party you know from from gang roots you know, tribal roots, like more of a tribe to me than gang, because gang is just, ah, whatever, you know. That's, that's what they use, that's what Fox tell you every time somebody gets shot. <laughs> so building off of the Black Power um, Panther movement, they had a particular um, point on their 10-point platform that focused on schooling, mm -hmm. education. And that was very important for just about every organization from that era, from the Black Power Movement era. And you yourself very much value education. You're an inquisitive thinker, you love science, you love in particular nature, but you made the cognitive decision in the ninth grade to withdraw from school. And I remember you telling me about that time that you were being trained on a platform going nowhere as opposed to learning anything in particular. Can you explain more about that decision and also some of the strategies and potential solutions for education in this current climate? Yeah, so the ninth grade was uh, rough for me. I mean, school in general was rough for me. It wasn't a place that I was able to enjoy. It wasn't a place that I felt like catered to my needs in the community that I, was, uh, that I grew up in. It didn't, it, they didn't cater to me. So I, I did make the conscious decision. It was well thought out to, to, uh, to drop out in the ninth grade. And it was a, a very strange event, and we had, a, we had a, a real deep conversation about this. I do love nature, and I do love science. And it was a, I don't remember what year it was, but they were bringing the Endeavor, the spaceship Endeavor out in LA. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, I'm, in, I'm in class, I'm in uh, middle school, talking to my teachers science, you know, I'm learning about the cell nucleus and, you know, what, what a plant does and how photosynthesis works and everything. And I'm seeing them drag this spaceship down my streets, cutting down the trees to help me breathe. And I'm asking my teacher, if trees are important and we need trees to, to breathe and all, they bringing a spaceship down the street, spaceships, they put holes in the atmosphere and all this stuff. So ain't that kind of like counterproductive? Like, we, like what's going on right now, you know? So once, I didn't get, I didn't really get a, I didn't get a, the response that I was looking for. I didn't even really get, <laughs> I didn't get responded to at all, really, you know, it kind of got swept swept to the side, they're like, that's not what we're teaching you in here. We're not teaching you to ask questions. We, <laughs> we're teaching you to answer them. No, but, uh, so I thought that was very interesting, and that was, a, that was one of the defining points for me that let me know, you know what, school is not really, for me, it's not really teaching me things that I can apply in my day-to-day -day life, and not just in the sense of like, oh, I need street knowledge because I'm on the streets. I mean in the sense of things that I can apply as a 16, 15, 14, 13 year old and go out and, and prepare me to enter the workforce as a young adult. And it, it just weren't, there, there weren't things like this being uh, afforded to me, I, you know. So that, that, was a, that was a very heavy decision. And I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy because it's a, uh, and to lead into, you know, like things that can be done to help, to help better the educational system. I was talking to my little cousin just the other day and preparing to come up here and sit in front of all of you guys and talk about stuff that needs to be spoken about. But I asked him, uh, Xavier is his name, 11 years old, maybe 12 at the most. I said, Xavier, man, 
what, uh, what can be done? Like, how do you feel about school, you know? What can, what can they do in the schools to, to make it better for you? You know, just to pick a brain. 11 years old, that's so much just knowledge waiting to pour out, brimming with potential, just, you know, ready to go. So he told me, man, the teachers are a little strict. You know, if we have more fun activities in school, that would be really cool, you know? So I'm like, these things are like, it's a, these things are things that are perpetuating themselves, you know? Me not liking school didn't have a lot, it wasn't the fact that, oh, I just hate schools because teachers ain't schools, or I'm just a black boy that don't want to go to school. It's like, what am I being taught? Is it stuff that I want to learn? My little cousin is sitting right here telling me that schools are still strict. And I know it's not, I'm not saying all teachers are horrible, but it's like, where do you find the balance between a teacher who actually cares and really can treat these kids as kids? and let them have time to be a kid, you know? Someone, and it's, I think it all stumbles and boils down to a whole financial thing because you may have teachers there who are worried about paying bills and it may just be a check for them, which is okay. But at the same time, it's different divisions that you can get in for that. But yeah, I think it's funny, you know, but to pour resources into schools, to pour resources into schools uh, that, that deal with people caring, you know? People caring, because I think that starts, that starts alone. You, uh, uh, it goes a long way to show someone you care and then you can tell them you can tell them what to do after they know how much you care. But yeah, you know, just, just put, in, put, in, put in a people who are more engaged in schools. That's what I got from my little cousin, you know? So that's, that's what I, how I think we can fix, how I think we can begin to see some change in the school system and education and, and not having people drop off, drop out in the ninth grade because teachers don't want to talk about why trees are being chopped down to bring spaceships to a museum that, you know, well, we, well, who needs to know about a spaceship, you know? I mean, not like that, you know what I mean? Rocket science is great. Everything is great, but I, there's, big, there's larger issues in the black community than having a spaceship at a, at a museum that, you know, you got to pay to get into, and you know, it's, a, it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> it's a rabbit hole. So following upon uh, one of the points from the Black Panther Party 10-point platform, uh, food was another big one. And in particular, they had the free breakfast programs and ser uh, several food programs. Um, several years ago, uh, we had a conversation that's been ongoing now. Uh, whenever food comes up and access to food, food, food resources come up, one of the first solutions that is proposed is like, oh, we need to have more stores in the neighborhood, right? Because there's no uh, fresh food or good food in the neighborhood, whatever. We need to have more sort of box chains. And you've been adamantly and completely against that model, right? And what you say we actually need is land, right? Much more than any type of like food, we need land. And with that land, then you can grow your own food. You can have your own resources. Then you can have, you can decide what you want to do with the land itself. Can you explain more about that? And then also why is land so important? Oh man, uh, America, it was founded on land, you know? Land is, we was born here to cultivate land, you know? and. It's a, it's a necessity, I feel like, because to have land, to have property, to own something, it gives you value in America, definitely. You know, maybe in other countries as well, but land, to have a piece of land is something that, in a sense, can, can be, I mean, it's like knowledge almost. It's like something that can be taken, it's second to knowledge. You get knowledge, no one can take that away from you. You, get, you got a piece of land and you, you earned your place, you earned your keep, you know? And with the power, land, with land comes power, you know? So they propose, they propose, oh, to fix the hunger problem in America or to fix the hunger problem in black communities, we'll throw grocery stores in there, but then they don't employ the people who live in the communities who buy and shop at these grocery stores. So that's not really fixing the problem. And I thought, well, if they put grocery stores in there, who own the grocery stores? Do they worry about food? What if we had our own grocery stores? Would we worry about food? What if we could put our own prices on things? What if it wasn't prices on things? What if we could barter? What if we grew things in, up, in, in abundance because we have fertile ground and soil to grow things on or do what, what we will? And not because it's my land and I want to keep it or, it's, or no, that's your part of the land. No, this is our land. We don't have any of it. We need it. It's necessary. Black people don't have land. It, it, we started without land. We still don't have land. Nobody giving us land. So we got to take some land. We need land. That's what it is. You know, we can grow food. We can, you, can be, you, can, you can do so much. You know, you can, you, you can have stores. You can do whatever. You, you can begin to build. You can begin to build on that property. You, and then you can begin to see a, a community grow and a community be able to be self-sustainable once that money is, is flourishing and, and circulating in within that community. But it starts off with having the land because then you, you come with the, the rent and the, ta and the taxes and everything, you know, 
that, that you have to pay for this land or whatever. And that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother story or whatever, you know, but it starts with the land. It starts with the land to have that freedom of being able to say, this is mine, I own it, we can do this. Hey, let's come together, let's grow this food. We can solve this hunger problem. Because it's not a problem, it's, it, 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 it's not a problem, it's like a, I feel like it's more so like a, something that's being stripped, you know? Because it's, it's billions of pounds of food being wasted every year, so how is hunger a problem? You know, it's just access is being denied to that food. And who is it being denied from? Us. Why are we hungry? Because we're being denied food. When is food to be wasted, I guess, you know? But if that was ours, then I don't think this, I don't think it would be happening. I think it's very important to have land. I think it's very important to have land, you know? So looking through, which we did on several occasions, looking through the archives of several organizations that came out of this time period, in particular the archives that are housed at the Southern California Library, one of the sort of key principles that these organizations really much uh, pride themselves on was the ability to craft out time to sit and think about these issues, not to sort of have like a knee-jerk reaction or response mm -hmm. to what was happening and what was going on. And I remember one time, this must have been around 2009, it was really when there was a, a slew of police killings that were happening across the country. Uh, there was a young brother that got killed in South Central, I think maybe off of Vermont, actually. And we were talking about the police, right? And your response to what, you know, my question about the police was like, well, in actuality, the likelihood of me getting killed by the police is pretty small, right? But the likelihood of me dying because of the police is high, right? And I was like, what the heck is this brother talking about? Like, like, this doesn't make any sense to me at all, right? And so you explained further, which is that the amount of resources and money being one of those resources, right? The amount of resources that are being poured into the carceral state, right? Into prisons, into policing, parole, whatever, whatever, right? It comes at a very severe cost. Yes. And that cost is the complete disregard for humanity at all. Yeah. And so you were saying that, you know, look, we don't have any hospitals around here, right? And the few clinics that we do have, no one has the money to be able to afford to go there, right? In large part because all of the resources from this neighborhood are going to policing, are going to the buildup of the carceral state. So that's a very, you know, sort of complex way of looking at policing, not just as like the individual police officer killing somebody, which is a bad thing, right, on itself. Oh, yeah. But let's get at the crux of the matter, like what's really happening, right? So could you explain more about that and this notion of being able to have the time to sit and think? Exactly. So the, to, to, to be able to, to discuss these things, you have to have, a, I feel like you, what's necessary is a space, an open space for people to come and discuss these things and not having that space is crucial because then you don't get to discuss these things. These kind of conversations don't get to, get to be had. So I feel like a lot, of, a, lot of the, a lot of the problem with that is, and then why I said that, where my head space was at, when I was like, man, the police might not kill me, but I'm still gonna die because of the police. It was that in a sense that, you know, all of these resources are being poured into policing schools, to policing black communities and black and brown communities, inner city communities, communities under the poverty level, you know? And all of this money, instead of being poured into libraries like Southern California Library, Social Justice and Public Research, that's how I used it, you know? Instead of being poured into uh, places, institutions like this, you know, we get, these, get this money poured into police stations and, and not poured into healthcare. And, not, and I don't mean just, oh, pour money into it, like, oh, we need money just poured into it, because money is not gonna fix problems. You can't just throw money at problems and expect that to fix it, you know? It'll, it'll go a long way in doing things to help solve it, but then you have to then begin to think about the people that are in charge of this money and how it's being spent. But to get the bag first and then worry about how you're gonna spend it, you know? We need to get, we need to get this money together and, and we don't have it because it is being poured into the, police, into the policing of of inner city schools, of, of neighborhoods, you know, just parks, you know, things like this. Instead of resources being poured into maybe uh, doing some renovations on some of, these, some of these neighborhood parks, it's being poured into, oh, how can we put cameras up here to catch crimes being committed? How, how can, instead of implementing after school programs or, or places that, that were like, for me and my teenage years and throughout my life and still, the library, the library was my safe haven, and it was a place I can go, a place where I met this brother and have, has, have had a flourishing relationship for 10 plus years. You know, so when we, when we don't have those resources being poured into healthcare, 
and we don't have those resources being be important to keeping businesses open and sustaining the wealth within the community and it's be important to police stations that in the police stations aren't hiring people within the community They're, these people are coming from way out in the boonies to come tell me how to live my life to come point a gun at me because I don't look like you and you worried about how I'm going to react because you think I'm violent because all you know is something that you've never been exposed to or seen, you know? So money, the money that we pay our tax dollars are going to this, which, which it creates that cycle of us not being able to have anything, us not being able to have safe places to go, us not being able to have health care because not only do we not get employed and we can't afford it, it's no, no resources are being put into the black community, no hospitals, no clinics are being put out here, you know? We, we just don't have it and we, and we need it. And, and for that to happen, I feel like a lot, of the, a lot of the shift in mindset as far as government spending has to go back towards a place of education and early childhood development and, you know, and keeping house, house family units together. And the last question, because I'm cognizant of time as well, I'm running out of time, uh, has to do with art. Uh, and in particular, I'm thinking about that art has been central to black struggles for freedom. So that the black power movement is going on, but the black arts movement is running side by side with it. Right? And you yourself are a very accomplished artist, as well as being a um, dynamite speaker, just all around sort of renaissance man to, to a certain extent, right? Thank you. But why and how, or maybe how is a better question, how do you see art playing in today's struggles in terms of for freedom? Well, I, I believe that art has been at the forefront of, uh, of, of Black liberation since way, way, way back, you know, since the beginning. Black has been deeply rooted in the black, it, it, black. <laughs> Art has been deeply, uh, deeply rooted. In, it's, it's, it's in the black community. Music is art. It's art all around us. It's always been a great way to express, a, a great form of expression for everybody, regardless of creed, color, nationality, or anything like that, you know. Art has always been a wonderful way to express yourself in the form of music, in the form of painting, in the form of poetry, in the form of spoken word. And I think it should and will continue to be as important as it is now because the fact that you can display something like these things on a wall and it can mean so many different things to everybody in here and still hold so much weight and still hold so much gravity or you can dance or you can perform or you can be a, an artist as far as a, a rapper or a singer and you can educate people with songs you can educate people with art you know you can you begin to open up a whole new door when it comes to breaking the breaking past a barrier as far as it goes with communicating with some with someone art is a great way of communication if people didn't know that it's awesome <laughs> but yeah yeah so art is art is art is uh, it's very important you know it's very important it's ways for people it's ways for people especially black people to express themselves it's one of the only outlets that we have that we are actually appreciated for being good at uh, did i did i slip away can y'all hear me it's one of the, y'all heard everything I just said? I thought I was slipping away a little bit. I guess my voice projects throughout the room anyway. But yeah, it's one of the only things that we've had and I think it will continue to be something that's very strong in our, in our strive for liberation and to have something that we, you know, not to say we ain't proud of nothing, but to have something that we can be proud of and something to say that, hey, our foot is down in America and we feel like we belong here and we do belong here, so this is it, you know? And I feel like art shows that. Art shows that a lot. Yeah. So we are out of time right now. It's about uh, 7.30. Uh, we'll take probably like 10 minutes. Is, is Darren still here? Yeah. yeah. We're opening until 8, so you're welcome to ask questions. You guys will take questions. And thank you, everybody in this room for yeah, hanging around. Thank you guys for showing up. We, we appreciate it. You know, Thank you guys for being engaged. If you, if you would like to engage in conversation, we're both open. Any questions or anything you would like to talk, to, talk about or ask us about? Yeah, I think we can roll it up the suitcase. <laughs> 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 Yes, yes, most definitely. Someone saying oh, yeah. something else. Most definitely, yeah. So, uh, make, make no mistakes. Moms and grandma was on my ass. Okay. Uh, what did you do? Who did you have to answer to? I can understand, you know, why you dropped out of school. Yes, yes, most definitely, yeah. So, make no mistakes. Moms and grandma was on my head. You know, it, it was, uh, <laughs> I, it wasn't, it wasn't received lightly, to say the least, you know. But, um, 
I still sought knowledge. That's uh, I think that's the thing that, that gave them great comfort in me making that decision was the fact that I was still seeking out knowledge. You know, it was never a day or a time where I wasn't looking to better better myself as far as my education went. And my, my mom saw that, my grandma saw that, you know. I stayed engaged in, in, in the library. I was there preparing, oh man, life changing things. I didn't even, I had no idea how much that library would change my life. But I always sought out knowledge. So I did have to answer to my mom and my grandma. Those are the, those, that, that, that was the, the long leg of the law or the heavy <laughs> you know, Yeah, so I, I definitely had to answer. And it's not, uh, I wouldn't, uh, it's not something that I would, that I would go up boastfully telling people, hey, drop out of school, don't go to school. But at the same time, if be comfortable in life and where, you're, where, you are, where you are at, you know, and if it's something that you really don't feel comfortable with, then you have to pursue what you do feel comfortable with. So it wasn't the fact that I, that I didn't want to be educated, it was the fact that I didn't want to be educated how they were trying to educate me. Did that answer your question? Oh yeah, yeah, we can we we can come we can come right up here. Um, I just had a, a, a question. You mentioned the Slossons that were the early early ones that they recruited for the Black Panthers. Now, what part of the '60s was that? Like, do you is it like you, early '60s or? Do you mean as far as the time frame? Yeah, the time frame. As far as the time frame would be, would be sixty seven, sixty eight. Yeah, 67, 68. Uh -huh. Why do you? Well, I believe they were. I believe they were very. Uh, they were, I, I believe they were very, very, uh, very much a part of it. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think there wasn't a. And I mean, well, fun, okay, fun so, fact. So, to answer that question, yeah. Bunchy Carter came out of the Slossons. Okay. He was a member of the Slossons, so he just went back to the Slossons to recruit from there to build up the LA chapter of the Black Panther Party. That's interesting because I knew guys that were in the Slossons. We were but there were businessmen in the Black Panther Party. The, the, the Black Panther Party touched. Had it had his hand in every gang in LA, in South, in South, in South LA. Oh yeah, yeah. The Black Panther Party was comprised. It shocking news of gang members. <laughs> so, so yeah, people that were caring about the community out there, feeding. I'm not. This is not a, a, a spite to you, but people that were out there t caring for the community, taking care of little kids. You know, making sure communities were safe for kids to go to school and that kids have food in their mouth. Were gang members. They were gang members. Tattoos, holding guns, yeah, they were gang members. So don't let don't let all of this don't let the media confuse you and like say that oh black people are ruthless and when it gets hot they shoot each other. No, no, we're humans. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the work that you all are doing, uh, both scholarly and in the community. Uh, appreciate it greatly. You had mentioned the media, uh, and I think that's such a big part of all of this. I'm fascinated that a black power exhibit would show up in the road. Uh, <laughs> and so, but this speaks a lot about people didn't see black power as something edifying or, or beautiful. I'm talking about mainstream people, which means white people, didn't see that before. What do you think perceptions about black power, black freedom movements, has that changed at all? or? Is, are things for the better? Uh, I hope you get my question. Most definitely. You wanna? Right. Oh yeah. So uh, I feel like uh, the media is a. Uh, it's like a. It's almost the bane of a uh, of of the existence of that which is black liberation because the fact that this is here in the broad, I feel like has a lot to do with media and how how fast things can spread and the fact that people are. Uh, quote unquote, waking up, you know, starting to realize like, hey, racism still exists. It's still, it's still a problem. It is, and it's a very, very big problem. So the fact that we can have conversations like this and the fact that a lot of these, a lot of the messages were spread through social media to get people here, you know, is a, is a, is a, a big pro. But then the con begins to come the way that we are taught to view ourselves as blacks and through the media, from the media, what's being portrayed, how we are being portrayed to, to ourselves through social media. And that's what I was trying more like hinting on with the media, how that's how you see us, that how Fox will pre present us, you know, because it, it is really big and it is large. And, it's, and that's a, that brings into, into question, how do we begin to have uh, platforms 
black platforms, not BET, you know, like, but real TV, like real TV, you know. And this, you're beginning to see it, you know, with, with the Black Panther and the uprising of, 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 of uh, actresses and, actress, and actors of, uh, of uh, darker pigment, black people in movies. You're starting to see it a lot more, you know, you're starting to see producers and whatnot. And it's, uh, you know, things take time and, and, I, and, and we can't accelerate this process. We can't accelerate this process, which media can also be used for, you know, so. I mean, it's, it's, it's the bane of the existence, you know, it's a good thing and a bad, and a bad thing. And I, I apologize, you followed that up with, uh, was it, did I touch on everything yeah. that you said? I, I thought you had said something else, I'm like, am I forgetting something right now? But, I, I think also to, to that point is that while the sort of black power movement has been broadcasted, it's the aesthetic of like a particular fascination of the black power movement, right? So people will dress up with afros and with black fists and that'll be sort of thrown out there. But when you look at the notes and nuts and bolts of actually what took place, so go through the archives at the Southern California Library and read through the Black Panther Party newspaper, right? And they're calling out these private foundations which are still in existence today for coming in to try to circumvent the work that they were trying to do in the first place, right? That part of the Black Power movement is not being broadcasted at all, right? And so oftentimes, we don't know about Bunchy Carter outside maybe of just the name of Bunchy Carter, right? We, we don't have any idea who he was, right? Unless he went to UCLA and you're a black student, then you would know he was shot and killed in UCLA, right? But the, the message of how he was shot and killed, COINTELPRO, what was going on, all that has been completely sort of washed away in the name of an aesthetic, right? Of just being cool, just being hip. It was a time. They do it at like the halftime show, the Super Bowl, right? And they put up like people dressing in wigs, like, oh, black power, right? Without any of the context and meaning of actually what took place. Good evening. Uh, I'm Yusuf from the library. And just want to say, because we're here with family, uh, and I'm going to kind of speak for you too, when you chip in. Uh, Hassanis is a big part of our heart, right? And we love it very much. And I want to say that in front of everybody, right? Um, and there's a lot of stories that we can tell. I think when I was first going to Hassan, he might have been like 19. And he told me, matter of fact, he was like, people in this neighborhood know me. And we were standing on the sidewalk. I was 14. Right? 14. Little kids walked by. Hey, Hassan, what's up? OK, the kids know you. Old like young man walked by. Hey, Hassan, what's up? Young people walk by. Literally, everybody that passed the sidewalk while we were standing out there said hello to the sign. And we were like, man, like, what would that mean for an organizing project to have this person that knows everybody and has respect from every segment of our community begin to help us build a project in the library? And we were trying to figure out how to do it and how we can have support to make it happen. And I say this because there's a lot of organizations on the property now that are getting essentially millions of dollars to do gang intervention and save the young people from themselves, right? And there was a time when, and I'm gonna tell a little bit about your business, but when he didn't have a lot of hope, right? And he didn't, he didn't know what was gonna happen the next day, it was like, you know, it's, it's, it's too much to even have hope and not have that work out, right? And we said, well, we don't have much, but whatever we have, we're gonna help you. We wanna get at least to tomorrow and then we'll see what happens next week. Let's just get to tomorrow. And he was like, nah, I, I ain't really about that right now because I can't even take care of myself. Right? And guess what his homies told him? Because what the nonprofits will tell you is like, your homies don't want you to make it, right? That's what they tell you. Your homies ain't gonna support you. It was his homies who said, if they fool if the library's gonna help you, take their help. Right? It was a community that said, if there's people to help you, make sure that you get that help because we want you to succeed. And that's why he's standing here today. And so I think it's just really important right. that we always think about like, how do we create change and what do we do is and, and, and the fact that Sasani can do it for himself, but he didn't have the support he needed to be able to do that work, right? And so that's really a big message that, that we want to make clear is that uh, we want people in our community now because he's a genius, but he's not exceptional, right? Like exactly. everybody in our neighborhood is like that and deserves the support that Sasani's been able to get so they can stand here in 10 years later and be able to talk about what they know. And that's what we want to see for our community. Exactly. But most importantly, I want to take this opportunity to tell you how much we love you. Man, I love you too, man. You know. Thank you, man. Yeah, so uh, don't uh, 
don't be pouring all of your donations into these big corporations. Go, <laughs> go, look, go look, look no further than your local library to find to find saints and saviors, you know, of the uh, of the black community of the. Uh, what do they like to call us? What are they the troubled youth, endangered, at risk? <laughs> yeah, all of, all of those crazy phrases that they put on us. I just, uh, it's just uh, people with people that need guidance, you know. But institutions like the library, you know, that's things like this, things that you may not think are out there are things that, you know, guys, you guys, are all us. We may not know the resources that are readily available for our kids, I don't have kids yet, but our kids being the youngsters that are coming up now. But a lot of the times it's right at, you know, within arm's reach, you know, if you reach out. And I'm grateful, I'm, I'm grateful. I wouldn't be here. I don't think I would be here. I would be dead or in jail right now for the rest of my life. I was gang banging heavy, you know, and it, it's, it's a fact, it's the way it is. Y'all put, y'all wouldn't believe it looking at me right here, stand up, but no, I was running the streets, doing all the stuff that y'all think is crazy. And, Oh, you see on the news, that was me doing all of that stuff. And through a couple of people who really cared and, and who, who really took the time out of their lives to, to help me in my life, you know, with, regardless of what, what they were going through in their life, they took the time to help a uh, 14-year-old at the time. <laughs> I looked old when I was young. I looked like this. I've been looking like this since I was 12, believe it or not. <laughs> Saying to the hair. But yeah, places like that, you know, so I really think it's important to like a, to do some community research and to see like what places are in, are in your neighborhood. And a lot of the times, a lot of the times it will be a library, man. Librarians are great and I didn't know it. I did not know it, I had no, no clue. But, and they're one of the things I think that get the least funding in, in neighborhood, especially in the black community. Libraries don't get nothing. So, you know, stop at your local library and, and drop your kid off. <laughs> <Don't be good>. <laughs> <laughs> They're open arms, they're open arms. It was a safe haven, it was a safe haven because it was a place that we sought out to get away from the police, to get away from harassment, to get away from somebody shoving a gun down my face, asking me to lift my shirt up and do a circle, you know? When you don't want to deal with that, they had their doors wide open for us. And not only that, they, they defended us, you know? They didn't, uh, they, didn't, they, they, they didn't advocate violence or hold, come in here with your drugs and hide drugs or hide your gun in here. But it is, you know what, if you, if you are right now here messing with you, we're not gonna let that happen. So just the fact that they had open doors, the fact that it was there and it was a place that I could go, that me and my friends could go, we could go hang out and use the internet without being charged. We can go get on Facebook, we can go read a book, we can talk, have conversations about what's going on in the neighborhood to these people that care. Because a lot of the times the librarians know about what's going on in the neighborhood. They work there every day. They, gotta, they see the same things, you know, they see the same things that we see. So I, I think that's a, I think libraries are slept on, I really do. So I, if I could just add, the Southern California Library is not a part of any like library system. So it's not part of like the Los Angeles Public Library or the Los Angeles County Library System. Yeah. It's a private library that was founded sort of like a, a lefty group. For, for the sake of time, uh, it was initially found as like a research sanctuary for academics. Uh, as Yusuf became director along with Michelle uh, Welsing, they've opened it up to the neighborhood around there, right? So you have all these archives from organizations such as the Black Panther Party or COPPA, um, but you also have the oral histories of people who live directly in the community. And so what, why I think it's important to support librarians. I have a personal yeah, investment I, in librarians. I apologize. That's why. Not yeah. just any library. <laughs> I, I say, yeah, not not yeah. just any library. I apologize. I was a, yeah. little, a little broad right there, but not just any library. But I think it, it was that particular space that did a particular thing. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's key to recognize what those spaces are. And identifying It's located spaces. on Vermont. And what's the cross street? between Slauson and Gage off of Vermont, right down the street from um, John Muir. Yeah, John Muir. John Muir Library is across, John Muir Library is across Gage, so yeah. Well, you, yeah, 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 so. Yeah, yeah, do uh, the, the way uh, the way my game times uh, were operated, I, I, I wasn't afforded the luxury to go to that library. <laughs> but yeah, but I, I had a library, I had a library I could reach out to. But, but just on that, the reason a lot of young people can't go our library is because they would go to the John Muir Public and the librarians would call the police on them. Yeah. yeah. 
We had a youth group that was working with us take a tour of the John Muir Public Library with staff with them. One of the young people laughed during the tour and, and the librarian couldn't call the police. So a lot of times they would, they would have a bad experience at the public library and then come to our library. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> I mean, and, and it, ch it changed a lot, you know, and, and that's a, but the John Muir Library is a, I don't, it was, it was a place you could go, but that's a library, like, you know, metal detectors and everything, it is, it's a weird place, so, you know, I mean, I hate to recant on what I said, but not every library, you know, like, it's, it's identifying those places, you know, identifying the places and the people, more importantly, identifying the people, you know, that, 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 uh, that, that, that do care and that will care, and it's hard to do, it's not, it's not just a, snap your finger, it's like, oh, I found somebody, who cares? You know, it doesn't work like that, but slowly, I, be, I, I believe that, the, that uh, it, it is a, a drawn out process, but it, it is very, very possible, very possible for these, for these places to be, they are, there are hidden gems in, the, in neighborhoods, I believe, and there, there's potential for them to be, to pop up, you know, like, you know, it's just about, about outreach and, you know, how we can, how we can begin to, to, to put that into motion, you know, getting these, getting these, uh, these places, these safe havens, you know, popping up. So maybe it's time for one more question, because um, because I've been informed we have to leave here at eight o'clock. I'm gonna step up. In terms of the exhibit, where does the exhibit, I know this, uh, some of these are private collections and all of that, do you, do you know if it plans to be taken on tour, will it be going to other cities, or this is just it? We're gonna ask uh, Darren. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Soul of a Nation uh, started at the Tate Modern in London. It was curated by an American curator and a British curator for the Tate Modern in London. Uh, it went to the Brooklyn Museum. It went to Crystal Bridges, Arkansas. It came to the Broad Museum, and it was just announced that it is now traveling. The Broad Museum was going to be the last stop. It was just announced that it is now moving on to the Dion Museum in San Francisco. So it has one more stop after us. represents a lot of the issues that we're combating, right, and that the people that we care about are combating. But part of it was we wanted our communities to have access to their artists. Like, this, these are our, this is our exhibit, these are our artists, and so we felt that's how we would partner. So there was, there was some, some financial resources that they gave us to contract with us for that. Part of it is being able to curate some of these evenings so that more people can speak and have the opportunity to do that. Um, but part of what we want to do is get these out to our schools and our communities. We have a lot of artists in our neighborhood some who are locked up right now who don't know any of these artists' names. I didn't even know these artists' names until I started working at the library, like Samella Lewis or all these people. Um, so that's why we partnered, but it was a very difficult decision. And we even talked to our community, like people that are our own partners and said, what is, should we do this given? But I was just telling someone, like the Walton Family Foundation had this exhibit before it came here. And so that is a question of like, what does it mean that the billionaires ha have a liking for black power art now? Like, what's happening to the moment, right? The, the Annenberg Foundation has a hip hop exhibit right now. LACMA has Charles White, right? Like, all these spaces now are doing that. So, that's another, that's a really important question about we're already existing these contradictions. So, we felt like we could say no, but it's going to happen. So, how can we make room for our communities? That's what we're trying to do. That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And, get, and now everybody in this room knows about Southern California Library for Social Justice and Public, for public Research. All right, so I think uh, that's it. Thank you very much for coming out. Appreciate it.